this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, we are back. Colonel Frans for you. One Ricky commander, four Ricky uh, second in command operator. I must tell you the new star on our show. So you are most welcome and thank you for being here. I know that you're talking to us while you have a, a, a leaking plaster of Paris, or at least your ankle. Perhaps you can just tell us what happened there and then summarize where we've been. I think we're moving on to 3-2 Battalion now and just tell us the story. But welcome back. We are really grateful for you. Of course. Once again, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, of course, I want to... Um, as I've mentioned to you, no, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm virtually, technically, and you know, electronically impaired. So you know, everything that's happening behind the scenes is is really new and strange to me. But as it may be, um, thank you once again for for hosting this and um, what you are doing. And I would like also like to express my thanks to the people that viewed um, episode one. And, um, you know, all the, the positive comments. And I am totally astonished that um, people would actually, you know, take their time to, to look what I have to say. Uh, it, it's strange, but thank you very much. I don't, I hope I don't disappoint the people. Uh, my wife commented, you are talking too long. Make it shorter. So um, <laughs> I'll, tr I'll try and, you know, make it shorter. But um, there's there's really a lot to to share, but um, we'll take it. Um, about my leg, yeah, it's reconstructive um, uh, surgery. Surgery, and uh, it's a parachute accident that happened 22 years ago. It will also come out in in probably one of the later uh, episodes. But um, it, uh, the, the the orthopedic surgeon said. Um, six weeks ago, you have a choice. We either operate in three days time and, 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 you know, rectify that needs to be rectified or the probability of putting off your foot in six months time is, is there. So I opted for the three days and here I am, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's a story for another day. Quiz, thank you very much. I um, would just in, in episode two, like to recap and um, just make a terms of reference for the people viewing this episode um, where we stopped last uh, or the, the previous previous episode. Um, I stopped where I said that uh, I left infantry school and um, did a pre-selection for a group that they wanted to establish in 32 Battalion, a, a Reiki group. And um, I was actually supposed to go back to Parachute Battalion to um, form the uh, leader group for the uh, next year's intake, but I opted to, to go to 32 Battalion. Um, at the end of the junior leader phase at um, infantry school, I became a CO candidate officer and you get um, on your lapel, you know, this it's like a white strip. So, that's what it was. We cleared out in October of, um, what was it, 70, 78. And um, we reported at Waterkloof and um, went on to the Flossy C-130 uh, bound for Rundu. Now, interesting, um, on the Flossy was a lot of people, you know, returning to the operational area. Um, but also then the potential leader group and then the potential recce group of 32 battalion, as well as the people that were selected for 31 battalion, the, the Bushman um, battalion that was about some kilometers to the east of, um, in, in the eastern Caprivi. Um, We, we boarded the aircraft and there was some of the people in my own platoon that also went to 32 Battalion. 
And then there was a few guys that actually opted to go to 31 Battalion to join the Bushman um, Battalion. Um, by the names of, I, I would like to name them, a Fritz Fischer, um, which um, later, and, a, and an interesting story about him, um, beca uh, uh, got his doctorate in, in law and became the youngest um, guy at, at Kentron or Krijgkor to do marketing. Interesting story, but um, a story for later. And then um, Yaku Maj, the, the son of Dirk Maj, that was the, uh, the, the, I think it was the, I can't remember the political party he was, but um, the ruling party in Namibia. And we were great friends as well in the platoon at infantry school. And I went on our 14 days, I went to their farm in Namibia and we hunted Kudu and Yeland and whatever. And I also had then the privilege to meet, um, obviously, Dirk Maj, and then, um, uh, slipped my name now, but a very interesting guy. He was the, um, uh, the head of the, the, the newspaper in, in, um, in Namibia, but an interesting guy. Story for later. Of course, we, we arrived in Rundu with a flossy landed at Rundu, and we were met um, by a few uh, representatives of 32 Battalion, and obviously the guys from 3-1 had their people collecting them. And um, as you may know, and the people may know, that 32 Battalion's HQ and headquarters was actually in Rundu. Um, so we were met by or the administration was done by a, a staff sergeant, could have been W02 Rosa. Um, also a, a very interesting guy, and he became a legend in, in 32 Battalion as a, a HR guy, and he did all the paperwork and, and whatever. Now, in that group, there was two uh, groups. The one group was the, 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 the people that, that opted to um, go for the recce group and then the normal leader group intake for the, uh, for the companies of 32 Battalion. At that stage, um, Colonel Nell, Gert Nell, was still the officer commanding. And then when we went to the, the, the HQ to do our administration, we were obviously met by the RSM. Now, the RSM at that stage was no other than Sergeant Major Pep van Sale. Now, rest in peace. Um, when Pep was a, a great guy, um, his posture was just of such a nature that, um, uh, you know, he installed absolute discipline and, and he was a epitome of, of, of a good soldier good discipline and, and everything. Um, he also got us into a squad and, um, you know, he, ha he has this big moustache and, and, you know, a really uh, impressive guy. And one of the first things he said to us as a group, now there was candidate officers and, and NCOs. And he said to us, I am going to be your father. I am the, fa uh, the, the RSM and I'll be your father in 32 Battalion. And the first thing I want to say to you young guys arriving from infantry school, it's a good breeding ground, but um, real life starts now. So, and he immediately said, you young officers or potential officers, you have a lot to learn. So don't think you are um, above anybody else, but I will teach you the finer things of being an officer, being an RSM, and I will teach you. And um, I've, in my previous uh, interview, I, I referred to coat hangers or, or, or points of reference. Now, that was also one of the points of references in my total military career um, what uh, RSM Pep van Sale that, that day 
communicated to us. I can recall a few times where, you know, full lieutenants and captains wasn't standing on both feet when they were talking or hanging on to a, a, a dorsal or whatever. And they and very respectfully, he would halt, salute and say, Captain, stand on both legs, please. You are an officer. Present yourself as an officer. So, you know, RSM Pep had that, that, that direct way of, of talking to you, but also, you know, just installing the good military discipline and, and so on. Um, and then Sergeant Major Pep or RSM Pep would also conduct and be the um, leader of the selection of the 32 Battalion um, Reiki Group to be um, at in a, in a week's or two time. Um, of course, we cleared in at Runu. Um, we slept over the night and all administration was done. And then we were told that we would depart for Runu, uh, not for Runu, for Buffalo. That's towards the east of Runu, about, what is it, about 230 kilometers. Um, to the east, and it lies on the uh, Kwandu River, or the Okavango River. And um, I think we were issued with, with a weapon and um, handed out some ammunition because the road from Rundu to Buffalo was classified as an operational area, and obviously we had to be operationally prepared for any eventuality that that could or might have occurred. So we were issued that and um, slept over the night. And, and obviously in the mess, there was um, a lot of 32 battalion guys that, uh, that we met. Um, and, and specifically, I can recall and remember um, Des Berman, um, Russell Organ, and Jim Ross. And um, they at the latest stage also played a, a, a meaningful role, you know, and for me in, in, in 32 Battalion. In any case, we left the, the next morning um, for Buffalo and um, the road there is called the Witpat. And um, it, it, it stretches or, or runs in a, in a easterly direction. And, you know, we were on the back of a queer fool and um, it was very dusty, very uh, um, hot. And um, the, the whole trip took us about four to five hours to eventually get to uh, Buffalo. Arriving at Buffalo, more or less just after lunchtime, um, drove into Buffalo um, uh, on the banks of the Okavango River, uh, which is beautiful. It's really a setting um, that is extremely beautiful and, um, you know, it, the, the area just teems of, of wildlife, you know, elephant, buffalo, sable antelope, kudu, and whatever. And um, we were offloaded or, or asked to debus at the, at the HQ and fall into a squad, which we did. And then we were met and addressed by Eddie Fulhoun, Major Eddie Fulhoun, Echo Victor, Big Daddy, um, and, you know, yeah. When I saw him the first time, um, this Major just impressed me. You know, the, his demeanor, his, the, the way he addressed us, the way he welcomed us, um, it just impressed me immensely. And um, I instantly respected the person and, um, you know, knew that, that, that this was a person I could associate myself. And um, coincidentally, I spoke to him yesterday on the telephone. He's living somewhere in Natal. And up to this day, um, we have a connection. And uh, he's a wonderful person. And I would like to um, introduce him. And I told him to you to also tell his story because he is a true legend and every person in 32 Battalion and um, 
even further afield would um, testify that um, Echo Victor Eddie Fulhoun is a is absolutely a star and a, a, an example as an officer. And um, I think his story um, should also be recorded and and preserved. He's he's, he's really a a gentleman. Um, of course, yes. Uh, then we we dispersed. I think they they took us for a meal or whatever, and then they split us up. So everybody that uh, was there to to do the the, the three two recce thing um, was put to a side, and the others was marched off um, to the company, and um, they went their way. We were put onto Unimogs, and we drove to a, a tent, and we got off, fold in, and um, and then a person with the name of Blue Kelly, Staff Sergeant Blue Kelly, came to a fall. Now, Blue Kelly is really a tall guy, redhead, um, you know, also a, a, a well-built and, a, you know, a, a strong person. And I think he's Australian. And um, we, uh, whoever got us on the parade brought us to attention and Blue Kelly walked up and he stood in front of us. He had browns on with his bush hat. Um, on his left hip, he had a, a machete, a panga, um, you know, hanging to, to his knee. On, on the right-hand side, he had a, a, a six-shooter, uh, I don't know, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, not a pistol or anything. It was a revolver. So Blue Kelly stood there and he said, good afternoon. I am Blue Effen Kelly. Now, the Effen, you must interpret in the right way. And he says, I am the commander and the would-be commander of the 32 reconnaissance wing. And I do not speak Afrikaans. Not that I want to, because I even can't speak Afrikaans. So you have to bear with me speaking English. Is that clear? <laughs> <laughs> so that was Blue Kelly and our introduction to Blue Kelly. Um, so Blue was a very interesting character, um, respected him a lot. And uh, he, he was then our um, group leader, so to speak. And, and, and he dealt with us for quite some time. As his um, group sergeant major, there was a, a staff sergeant, Ron Gregory. Now, Ron Gregory was just an interesting character as well. And um, very quiet, very, you know, respectful and so on. But what a soldier, both of them. Blue Kelly and uh, Ron Gregory was really um, good soldiers. And um, they took us, you know, under their, their, their wings from there. Um, of course, then um, mm -hmm. we, we slept over the night at Buffalo. And uh, we were allowed to go into the, obviously, the mess to have a meal. And then afterwards into their um, social area, the pub. And, and we met a few uh, people there. Um, and once again, you know, two people that, that jumps to mind is Eric Rabi, Rapes. Now, Eric Rabi is a, is a very short guy. But, um, you know, if you look at him, he is just a naughty person. And, um, yeah, Rapes, we had a few drinks together. And then a person called William Mutlow. Um, William Mutlow also eventually went to Special Forces. But um, that's the two people I can specifically remember um, at that time. She slept over in Buffalo. And then the next morning, we had to troop to uh, the training area along the uh, Kavangu, um, about 7 to 10 kilometers downstream. Um, and we were on Unimogs. 
split up on a few Unimogs. And Eric was on one of the Unimogs, or the Unimog I was on, sitting at the back. And Eric said to me, Franz, it's part and partial of coming to 32 Battalion to be ambushed, but like a real ambush, you know. So expect that. And um, But, you know, he whispered it kind of into my ear. Any case, we were driving around and came around the corner, and holy by old, there it was. You know, um, there was a big bang, like a, let's say, assimilating a landmine or whatever, and all hell broke loose. And it was live ammunition firing over our heads, and, um, you know, really like a serious contact, which of none of us have seen in the past. So, um, yes, at infantry school, you had um, live firing exercises and so on. But, you, you know, it was, it was all fire being directed in the same direction you were shooting. Now, these rounds and firing was coming towards you, just over your head. And, and you know, the, the crack and thump thing and all that thing uh, materialized. And what actually made this thing more realistic is the Unimog we were on, a branch, caught the mirror of the, um, the Unimog. And when it came loose, it knocked Eric off the, the, the Unimog. It hit him on the arm and he was yelling and he was literally, you know, completely knocked off the, the Unimog. Um, and, and, and one could, could swear something hit him, really hit him. And, 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 you know, then it just contributed to the realistic, atmosphere of this in any case okay this was the um, you know initiating um, welcome saying to 32 battalion um, of course yes then we we came to the the training area we went into a a, a temporary base and um, you know stuck around blue kelly and and some of the uh, 32 instructors you know, orientated as to do's, don'ts, crocodiles in the river, hippo in the river, because that's where we had to go and fetch our water, bath, and, and clean ourselves. So there was always a sentry out um, if you went into the river to, to check for crocodile and, and, and hippo and so on. In any case, um, we were also then um, issued with AK-47s and ammunition. So for the next day, we did um, AK-47 orientation and, you know, some shooting exercises and whatever. Um, we all had our basic kit. It, I think it's a pattern six, they call it. It's a World War II um, pattern six uh, webbing and backpack and whatever. You were issued that when you cleared in at one side way back when. And, and you had to carry that with you. And that's also the kit we had when, when we actually arrived at 32 Battalion. Um, we were said, we were told that the, the, the selection would start the following day. Um, we were prepared for that. Um, our kit and equipment were um, sanitized, so to speak, um, you know, to make sure that there was no. Um, the flies are here listening to my story again, uh, of course. In any case, uh, our kit was sanitized to see that there's no hidden food or luxuries or funnies or, or whatever. And um, we were ready to, to you know, start the, the, the selection. Of course, we were about 40 people, uh, white, white guys, um, obviously leader group that uh, would, would form the nucleus of the 32 um, recce group. I just want to pause there for a while um, and, and, and put the 32 battalion recce group into context. Um, in the past, the, the recce, the true special forces uh, units used to do reconnaissance work for 32 battalion. You know, uh, reconnoir um, areas and places where there was bases and, and so on. And then 
they would give the information back to the intelligence people. They would, uh, you know, assimilate that and interpret that. And then 32 battalion would deploy into those areas and do the hard, grueling fighting work, um, which 32 battalion was, was renowned for. And um, so then in, when was this? There was a, a operation Iheki, where 32 battalion under command of um, Eddie Fulhoun, and then the, the Rekis attacked um, Iheki base. I think it was in 77. Now, what happened there is that um, the Rekis were dropped in, in the wrong position. They had to trek in, walk a, a long distance. Um, some uh, decisions was taken that they had to attack the base and um, it was a devastating uh, experience. Um, I think there were seven people of the reconnaissance commando killed and eight seriously wounded. There was one person of 32 battalion that was killed. Now, if you relate that into the numbers that was actually at special forces or the Rekis, it was, it, it really constituted about 25% of, of the true Rekis that was wiped out, which was, um, you know, it placed a, a, a big damper on the uh, existence of, of, of the Rekis. Not, not in the existence, but as to the, the application, how should the Rekis be deployed and what would they, what should they actually do? But as it may be, the numbers was down. And um, when there was, the, the, you know, the, the whole conflict in Angola it escalated in time. So the other tasks and duties of the reconnaissance commando um, grew. So there was a lot of work to be done. And um, if 32 required certain reconnaissance in areas, you know, apparently it was declined and said, you know, our, our numbers is this, that, and the other, and uh, we, we can't do that. So the powers to be decided that they would institute or create a own reconnaissance wing for 32 battalion. And it was agreed that uh, the principles and the training would be on the same level and on the same standards of the reconnaissance commando, the Rekis. So um, it was agreed like that, and that is how it would be. So that's why the, the reconnaissance command, uh, group of 32 was, was instituted. Back at, um, at, at the training area, then the next morning we were uh, loaded into Bedford trucks or Samuels or yeah, probably Samuels, not Bedford. And um, we were all blindfolded. We, we had cautious over our, our um, heads um, with all our kit and, and we started driving in the back of the, the, the vehicles. Now, what they didn't take off us was um, our watches, you know, our chronographs. So just before we left, um, remember now, I, I, in the previous episode, I did some scuba diving and so on. So it, it just happened to be that, that up to today, the watches I, die, I, I wear is a, is, is a diver's watch of sorts. So... You know, I, I set the time and um, we drove for about an hour. So when we got off, I checked my uh, watch and I saw, okay, we drove for about an hour. So we were offloaded and cautious um, taken off our heads and, 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 and there we were. So Sergeant Major Pep von Seil was there. So he said, okay, this is where your selection starts. Plot yourself where you are, and then you have the following bearing, and they gave a, a compass bearing. So um, you have to be 
at a certain uh, Romeo Victor RV point in a certain time um, carry on. Now, before you can work out actually where to walk to is to establish where you are. So how do you determine if you are just blindly dropped at an area to where you actually are? So, you know, you had to do dead reckoning and, and establish and look at landmarks to actually pinpoint where you are. Then on a map, um, you know, take your compass bearing and then um, walk in, in, in that direction to actually get to the, to the RV. Now, the, the area they dropped us in is, is a very flat terrain. So there's no um, geographical features, copies or hills or, you know, stuff like that where you could actually determine, okay, I'm here. And from here I have to walk. So that took some time and, you know, all the, the, the clever corporals and lieutenants from um, infantry school and everything you were taught in, in, at infantry school about navigation kicked in gear and um, it took us some time to actually um, determine where we were so that we can is, could establish where we were and then from there take it on. Eventually we did that and um, and off we went. Um, of course the, the, the selection was, was grueling. Uh, I mean we were all very fit coming from infantry school and, and so on but um, you know, at infantry school, the fast by five, they deprived us from food and so on. So you had that experience of, you know, little water, little food and so on. But um, that was in, in, in a hotter area in the bush. You had to, you know, care and fend for yourself and, and so on. So obviously it had an impact on, on, on the group. As I've said, we were about 40, 40 guys and, um, as we went along, you know, certain people said, no, you know, uh, no, this, this, this walking, going by vehicle is maybe better, this walking, no. So, you know, we started thinning out as, as we went on. Now, at, at every RV, um, you know, you, you had to do some extra PT and chase around and did a lot of, of things, very similar to to what you actually did at parachute battalion, you know, with with marbles and poles and uh, and so on, and we had to do, do some route marches and you know a long person and a short person would be put together and you know three in a team, uh, you know it was always a mismatch and you had to make a plan and and be initiative, you know, take your initiative to actually overcome the the, the problem and to um, execute what you had to execute. And um, so uh, the, 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 the selection went on for about three weeks, of course. Um, and I think eventually we were about 27 guys that, you, you know, was left from the 40. The, the guys that dropped out went back to the platoons or the companies at 32 Battalion, and I'm not sure if they actually absorbed them into um, the companies of 32 Battalion and if they were RTU'd or, or whatever. But that was basically the group that uh, completed the selection at 32 Battalion. I can recall the last day uh, when we came to the RV, there was a, you know, a nice big fire and a big um, drip Bien pot, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it in English, but um, uh, free like a yeah. iron pot. So yeah. call it a Dutch pot. Yeah, yeah. And um, and 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 who was actually sweating over this pot was RSM Pep van Seil. Now, Pep van Seil, being a good RSM and so on. He's a magnificent cook and, and he can make a pot and a lot of other things. And it was actually RSM Pet that was, you know, stirring this pot and, you know, making and adding this and adding that. And, and, and I can remember very clearly there was big mushrooms flow. So it ended there and uh, we had pop and, and you know, that 
pot of, of RSM pep. And it was really, you know, delicious, good. And we were all under the beer. And, and that was the end of, of the, the 32, let's call it pre-selection. Now, um, eventually I did the, the special forces selection as well. Chris. So I can actually um, do a comparison on the two selections, you know, and, um, and in retrospect, looking back at the 32 uh, selection, the physical part of it, I can um, really state that uh, e equal the, 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 the special forces selection, although at the special forces selection, there was other dimensions. You know, there was a thing they called the, the octopus and um, the iron cross and, you know, all funny things like that. And then I think the major difference between the two selections was um, the psychological selection in special forces um, there's a, a huge uh, focus on the uh, mental and psychological stability and capability of the individual that was um, in a professional way having psychiatrists and corp crimpers um, in special forces there was corp crimpers with you the whole time when you did selection. But then in 32 Battalion, it wasn't there. Now, it doesn't matter a lot, but um, I think uh, or, or at this, for the matter of this conversation, it doesn't matter a lot. But I think if you holistically look back at the different um, units and their capabilities and their eventual um, anwending um, usage. Application. Application. You know, it, there is a difference. So, uh, you know, the, the, the psychological part in the, the, the reconnaissance or the special forces is, is vital. But that wasn't there in the 32 battalion selection. Um, I would not say that the instructors and people um, with the likes of, of Pep von Seil didn't realize that. And I think they, um, you know, evaluated the people um, from an operational point of view to see if they had the ability and the capability to, to, to cope psychologically with whatever was um, thrown towards them. Um, was then we were taken back to, to the training area. And at the training area, um, we established a more permanent temporary base. Um, you know, in a proper way, we, we built our own babies and um, accommodation and so on. And, and most of the um, time then was spent on, on weapon handling, safety of weapons and um, skirmishing and, and, and things like that. And it was, it was said to us that the, the true Rekis uh, would come and train us in, in, in minor tactics. So in preparation for that, we, um, under the guidance of, of, of RSM Pep von Seil, um, Blue Kelly and some of the 32 battalion instructors, you know, prepared us and got us ready for what would then come. The one morning uh, then when we uh, reported for the, uh, uh, you know, attendance parade, um, there was three Rekis, true Rekis um, at the parade. Now, um, of course, they were turned out immaculately. You know, they were in browns, very neatly ironed. They all had jumpers on. Um, they were very, very neat. Uh, maroon berets with a bokop. And, you know, you always heard about the Rekis, but you, you never saw them and so on. And, and you know, they, 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 there they were. Um, and you could see strong, capable people um, very neatly. Although it was in the bush, they were, um, you could pull them through a, through a ring. Now, the three instructors, uh, they dealt off to 32 Battalion to do the, the Reiki group training was Lieutenant Andre Didrix, Didis. Now, Didis, um, 
became a or, or was a legend in in 32 battalion he's also passed away he's written a book and and um, andre didrix was really somebody you could look up to as an example and um left no stone unturned to have everything done to absolutely the highest standard and the best um, assisting him was a sergeant louis klopper um, kloppies kloppies um, i think on the second day we were there there was a signal coming through and he actually was awarded the honoris crux for i'm not 100 percent sure for what but um, also an, an excellent uh, instructor and operator. The third person was Lance Corporal Fanny Fonse. Fanny Fonse Strong, also a, a very renowned guy. He actually holds shares in the Reserve Bank of South Africa today as we speak. He became an electronic or a, a mechanical engineer and, and Fanny is also, you know. So, so we really had three people from the Rekis that, that that was top notch going to train us. I must um, add in, 31 battalion had the same concept. They also instituted a Reki group, and um, at the same time, a squad of the Rekis also went to 32 battalion to train their Reki group. Back to the 32 battalion Reki group. Um, Andre and them, in a very, very professional way, conducted a uh, adopted minor tactics course with us. Now, minor tactics in special forces, um, when you do the special forces um, cycle, the selection and um, training, you do the physical training part with a psychological analysis and whatever then you do a, a series of courses now each course in itself is a selection so if you follow one you out and so it's a building block system until you eventually do minor tactics now minor tactics is a accumulation of the skills you've been taught throughout the year in all the courses and um, they hone it to be offensive and the task you would eventually do in special forces from demolitions um, reconnaissance mine laying offensive operations etc so the 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 training andre and Klopis and and, and fani gave us was just that now i think the if, if i can recall correct correctly was was a bit shorter than the the that would be done at at the Rekis itself. But I think the standard and that what they taught us was on par. Bearing in mind, at the latest stage, I would do the same thing again. So I could once again compare what was done in 32 Battalion and what was done at the true Rekis was on par. So I can state and clearly um, testify that the training that the 32 Battalion Reiki Group received was very much on the standard that the, the true Rekis or, or, you know, the Recursions Commando um, guys received, trained by them. Um, so, you know, we were very, very thankful for the, the standard of um, training we received and it was good the last exercise was actually um, an exercise where we had to infiltrate from a certain area and do a reconnaissance on the our own temporary base and then the the place where the instructors lived but um, the instructors put out more 32 battalion um, staff members and so on to actually detect us coming and doing a reconnaissance and then we had to assimilate the attack and and so on so that was the last exercise um, and then that exercise culminated in that enemy base we had to re reconnoitre um, they would chase us 
which turned into a escape and evasion type of exercise and they started chasing us. So, um, you know, you had to escape and evade and um, it was extremely realistic and um, none of any of the uh, exercises we did was with um, blanks or whatever. Each and every exercise or shooting or ambushes or whatever we did was with live ammunition, real shooting, and, you know, you actually shot at the instructors, but you had to aim, you know, let's say 10 meters above the heads or, or, or so on, and vice versa. So if they applied fire to us, you know, it was, it was real shots coming over our heads. So um, that was, it was great. It was great training. And then eventually um, the, the next morning when we reported in, um, Andre and his team and the 32 battalion people, Blue Kelly, RSM Pep. Um, I can't remember the officer from 32 battalion, but in any case, you know, they, they went through the process and said, okay, X, you make it. Y, you make it. Um, B, no, you know, for the following reasons, we are not going to accept you into this group. And, and so it went. So eventually a group of, of 20 of um, us was selected to then form the, the, the recce group of 32 battalion. Um, and then strangely and interestingly enough, of course, um, something kicked in, which I, I don't want to say I found it strange, but yes, I found it strange. You know, a, a kind of a, I don't want to call it a secrecy, but that it exclusively was placed over us. You know, they said, okay, you are the guys that's now going to form the nucleus of 32 Battalion Recce Group. We don't want you to go into the base anymore. We don't want the, the companies or the other people to know who the actual group is that uh, passed the selection. And uh, we were kept aside. Um, uh, the, the guys that didn't make it also went back and, and I think integrated into the companies and um, that that's what it was. Of course, then um, uh, Eddie Fuljoen came over, um, um, Gert Nell still at that stage, uh, Colonel Gert Nell, you know, they got, congratulated us and, you know, gave us a pep talk as to, you know, the, the, the real importance, what the, the group would do be or had to, to do for 32 Battalion. And, um, you know, we were, we really became close, close, close friends. Um, and, you know, the slogan of um, 32 Battalion is Prulio Procusi. It means um, uh, merged in the battle or uh, me and the Yeah. So, you know, I think anybody that was in 32 Battalion or, or, or knows the 32 Battalion thing, will know. In 32 Battalion, there's no pussyfooting. And um, in many units, it's the same. But, you know, especially 32 Battalion, it's, it's brutal. It's straight down to the point. No funnies. Bare equipment. Do the job. And, um, and I can testify of that. Um, okay. Uh, of course, then we were um, taken to Amaoni. Now, 32 Battalion has three bases. The HQ is in Rundu, Buffalo, in sector, what's it, 20, which is on the uh, Kavango River, where the companies and the, the, the more conventional part was, and then Amaoni. Amaoni is, I think, about 230 odd kilometers to the um, west, northwest of Rundu. It's about 80, 18, one, eight kilometers from the um, cut line, from the border, and then about, uh, as the crow flies, about 25 kilometers to the, to the east of um, Congo. The first conventional military base of, of, of the SANDF in sector 1-0. Okay, we were taken to, to Amahoni. 
I'm only at that stage was um, just to give a, a, a short description of Amahoni. is a is a base with um, um, you know soil uh, embutments, a, a wall, which is about three point five meters high. Um, the it, it's built in a square. The it, more or less two hundred and twenty five meters, and then on all corners there was um, very very well. Um, uh, uh, strengthened bunkers and then in between a lot of bunkers and so on. So it was a well-protected base and um, um, it was a nice place to stay. So we were taken there. The, the basic facilities there is an ops room, um, then the tents where we used to stay and um, uh, uh, Elvietia, a light workshop troop, um, to service vehicles and so on, uh, QM store. Um, so so it's, it's very basic and rudimentary, but uh, effective. Um, so we shifted there, and then within the base, there's, there's, there's a wall that is split, and, and the companies, when they would troop into southern Angola and come from Buffalo, they would um, either troop with quaifuls or vehicles, to Amahoni, um, and then Amahoni would, would serve as the stage of base before they actually deployed into um, um, southern Angola. There was a runway. Um, the runway is about uh, 1,6 kilometers, 1,600 meters in length, and approximately 28 meters in width. Um, and, um, you know, they would, the companies would either troop in by vehicle, as I've mentioned, or then fly in by C-130s and, and they would land there. Now, um, once there at Amahoni course, um, we, uh, each, each group, the, 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 the teams consisted of five people. It was an officer, an NCO. Um, European, and then we would be allocated three 32 Battalion X Angolan troops. Not troops, they all, uh, well, there were some troops, but most of them were sergeants and corporals and lance corporals and so on. And most of them was, was actually um, soldiers that went for the real special forces selection and for one or other reason dropped off. I, <laughs> the guy... Guys, I had um, the, the one refused to jump. You know, you, he did excellently in everything. But when the parachute course was there and he actually demonstrated, you know, how the, the shuffle step, you know, he shuffle step, but he didn't move forward. You know, he went through the paces, but he didn't get to the door. So, you know, that's the type of guys we had. And they were brilliant. They were really well-seasoned troops. And, and it was very good. Blue Kelly was still in charge. They had their tent, and um, I was I, I was group number one or team one, and and so we were up to team ten. So my tent was right um, besides Blue and and um, uh, Ron's tent, and uh, the the ops room and his administrative area. So um, when the when the the black guys integrated with us. We spent a, a, a few weeks integrating. So, um, you know, they were seasoned soldiers in, in, in coin ops and so on. And we had this um, special training of, of minor tactics. So, you know, day after day, religiously, you know, we went out, um, um, did attacks, shooting, quick kill. And until we were really um, honed in as, as, as very, very good fighting teams and um, until we were ready to to deploy now the interesting story i want to relate relate was is um, at this stage we do, did a mortar uh, 81 millimeter mortar course and um, there was some boffins that uh, uh, instructed us and blue kelly which was a support weapon specialist was also, you know, involved. 
Now, another thing I want to mention is 32 Battalion never received new equipment. From the SANDF, they always received, um, you know, if you go and change your uniform for whatever reason, they would stitch it up and clean it, and they would send it to 32 Battalion. So 32 Battalion never received new uniforms or uh, new boots or whatever. So you could go to the store, go and draw boots, but it was second-hand boots or second-hand clothes. Now, for young lieutenants and corporals like us, it was great. You know, you didn't have to fade your clothes. You could go and draw faded clothes and you looked like a home one. <laughs> you know, it was, it, was just, it was just funny. But why I'm mentioning this, during this um, mortar uh, course we had, I had, uh, uh, he was a corporal, uh, Chaka. Now, Chaka fought in the, uh, the, the rumble in the jungle where Muhammad Ali and George Foreman fought in the Congo. He fought one of the um, pre-fights in the DRC. But tall guy, very athletic and, you know, really a, a star of a person. But during that time, for the first time we were there, we got new boots into the stores. So, you know, I mean, the, 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 the white guys didn't, you know, mind very much. But the, the 32 battalion guys, you know, the, 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 the traditional soldiers, for them, that was a big thing. You know, and, and we said, guys, go and get your boots. Now, a boot, you have to wear in. And most of the times, you will get blisters. Um, you know, if you don't do it correctly, but in any case. So, Chaka drew some boots and um, he got some blisters. But, you know, really serious blisters. And this one morning, um, before falling in, he came to me and he said, Tenant, oh, in the meantime, they, they, they took off the white bulkies and, and we were second loot. So, um, in any case, he came to me and he said, Tenant, I've got blisters. Um, you know, can I wear my pluckies, my, my slops? And I said, of course you can, you know, you know, deal with the blisters and, and, and the medics gave iodine and whatever. And, you know, he, he went. And when we reported at the, the motor training, Blue Kelly called him and he said, where's your boots? And he said, um, I've got blisters. And I asked my lieutenant if I could wear um, slops. And my lieutenant said, I can wear slops. And I heard this and I went to Blue Kelly and I said, Blue, um, you know, I think his blisters um, justifies that, the, you know, give him a few days break and he can put boots on again and um, that's fine. So for one or I don't know what reason, Blue just blew his lid. So, you know, he said, not the F and F off. Go and put on your boots. And, you know, he, he went ballistic. So I said to Blue, Blue, you know, what are we trying to prove? Um, let his feet heal. And, you know, let's carry on. It's not a question that we operationally deploying or whatever. We are in training. So Blue said, I'm in charge. I give the orders. F him. Put on his boots. In any case, we went on um, until lunchtime. Then lunchtime, Blue said to him, he, he, he's getting um, sandbag PT. He, so he had to run down, up and down the um, runway, 1,6 kilometers, I think four times for, um, as a, a penalty for not reporting with boots at the motor train. So I was really... And excuse my language, with, but first off, with Blue making that decision. But he was the, in charge of the Reiki group and, uh, you know, and it went. So he went, picked up his sandbags and he did his, his time. And we were all resting in our tent. So it was a, 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 a what's it, a four by four tent. Um, you know, the five of us were sleeping there. 
Bachaka carried a, a RPK, which is a heavy barrel um, AK-47. So he came back after the PT. Um, I don't know who watched. I think Ron watched over him, you know, doing whatever. And he went into the tent. Um, Ron into his tent. Chaka came back, put the sandbags down. And, he, you know, he was sweating in the middle of the day in the Caprivi. It becomes hot. He opened his, his uh, locker and he took out his rifle uh, or, or the RPK and he walked out. And my sergeant, black sergeant, was sleeping at the door, you know, and, and we all thought, you know, the, you know, he's acting a bit strange, but, you know, but when he walked out the door, he cocked his weapon. And um, my sergeant got up and Chaka was lining up, Blue was sitting reading a book. So he lined up. Um, Blue Kelly, and and he and he pulled the trigger. But as he pulled the trigger, the sergeant, you know, just knocked him off balance, and uh, 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 a few shots ran through the roof of the tent above Blue's um, head. So Chaka obviously had the intention to take Blue Kelly out. Now, I mean, that caused a major incident in that base and you know it was absolute chaos but when that happened Chaka threw down the, the weapon and he ran he knew you know there was a problem now so he ran over the northern um, wall and disappeared into the bush now we all you know tried to make sense and what happened and whatever whatever and obviously we came to the conclusion that he wanted to take out blue <laughs> So we mounted a, you know, teams and started tracking him, and and it became nightfall, and you know we didn't get him. Um, now, obviously, we reported this back to Rundu to the HQ, and um, obviously it's a it's a major and a serious incident. So uh, a board of inquiry was conducted, and um, you know. I gave my statements in terms of what happened. Blue gave his and whoever was involved. And um, Chaka was gone. You know, we didn't know where he was. A few days went by, but every day we, we had a security patroller around on my own. In any case, the reason why I'm telling this incident, of course, is the outcome of the, the, the Board of Inquiry was the following, that um, although Blue, as a staff sergeant, was a, the appointed commander of the, third, you know, the Reiki group, no problem, um, he actually had command over officers. Now, it was a neutral legal person that actually conducted the, the um, board of inquiry. So his recommendations was that it's understood within the context but um, the, the decision I made to um, allow him to do, uh, you know, use his, his slip slops or his pluckies was justified. Um, it was overruled by Blue, although he was the commander. But, um, you know, it's an unhealthy situation where um, an NCO could actually negate the, the decisions of a team leader that's an officer. And, and so on. So, you know, they made a big hoo-ha of this command and control thing. And um, in any case, to cut the long story short, um, Blue and um, Ron was removed as, as, as the commander um, due to that incident. Not that they were bad people. They were both excellent soldiers. And I never, or none of the officers ever complained on, you know, being subordinate to whatever but within the military structure um, you know it wasn't accepted so one day um, one of the patrols picked up a, a spoor coming back to the, um, uh, the, the junk where, where we disposed um, the, the rubbish of, of, of the base and um, it turned out that it was the tracks of, of Chaka so he came back 
I don't know where he spent his time, but um, obviously he was coming back. So he was captured and, um, you know, tied up and um, he was taken to Rundu. So um, when, when, when Blue was removed, um, they made me in charge of, of, of the group. So that's how I actually um, became not, uh, yeah, well, obviously the official um, in charge of the recce group. And, um, you know, there was a, a change in, in, in the whole situation. So, um, yeah, that was it. Of course, then, so it was a major incident and it, and it, it had a bit of a damper on, on, on the whole situation, but um, we were okay. So then, um, obviously, they found that, that we were well gelled as teams and we started, uh, we had to start doing operations. So our first operation, which we were officially tasked, was to go due north of Amahoni, go into southern Angola, look for um, any terror activities, and then, um, you know, like search and, and suk and vernietig, you know, search and destroy type of operation. So we did it as a group, not as a Small team, small team, small team. We did it as a group and we went into southern Angola and uh, we patrolled there and whatever. So, you know, we asked the guys, now, you know, just give us more information. What type of uniforms? What's this poor pattern? You know, what, 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 what? And um, one of the senior officers of, of the T2 said, listen, if you're in southern Angola, southern Angola is enemy territory. If he's black, and walks in any fashion like a soldier, you shoot him. So, you know, everybody there is an enemy, basically. You know, and I thought to myself, uh, it can't be true, but we'll use our own intellect when we are there. So that's how we started deploying uh, course. Um, and, and we gained actually very valuable knowledge. You know, we didn't shoot anybody. We didn't shoot civilians. Um, and we neither found anybody with a uniform or you know that that was real enemy and um that was it so um then the first real big operation the reiki group did was with uh, major eddie for um now Iheki took place as i've referred to where 32 battalion and and the reiki was involved so this op, uh, the deployment involved that they would take a company and, and go towards Ieki and see what's going on there after um, the Ieki operation. So the 32 Battalion Reiki group was deployed in front of the company, about a kilometer, two kilometers ahead, you know, to scout the route, to check out for tracks and things like that. So we did that and we were always within mortar supporting range and, you know, the, the system was good. And the closer we got to, to Iheki, the more spoor we picked up and, and so on. But another thing we picked up was two barefoot tracks that was constantly shadowing our company and then a very big boot. I would reckon a, a number 14 or 16 boot, but really a big, big boot. So I reported this to um, uh, Big Daddy, uh, to uh, Eddie v Echo Victor, and um, the, the Chevron pattern, and they, they all said, this is Bigfoot. Now, Bigfoot was one of the renowned Turk commanders in that area, and uh, they were all convinced it was Bigfoot. And the, the barefoot tracks, we couldn't quite, you know, uh, establish what it was. But eventually, um, we figured out that it's probably um, scouts of sorts and probably Bushmen that, uh, you know, scouted the, 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 the company and us wherever we were going. The closer we got to Ieki, um, you know, all of a sudden, 
uh, 14 comma fives and, and 23 moles and, and, and mortars and stuff started firing in our direction. Obviously not accurate, but um, it was obvious that somebody reported to them, we are in that direction. The, the fire was directed in our direction and, um, you know, we were compromised long before we were very close to the base. To cut a long story short, um, Echo Victor decided, no, we won't go and see what's going on there. They had a blood nose there in the past. And with whatever weapons they are shooting now, no, we're not going there. So we diverted and, and came back and, and, you know, went back towards the, 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 the cut line. Um, eventually, we actually caught the two small spoor. And it was two Bushmen that was, you know, sneaking around with us the whole time. And um, they were uh, sent off to Rundu or um, Oshikati or one of those places for interrogation and, and whatever. We didn't see them again. And then we came to a base Oshikangu um, after we came out. Um, and we dug in and that night uh, I woke up and I heard a command fogu. Now fogu means fire in Portuguese. But I could clearly hear that. I woke up by hearing fogu. And the next minute we just heard these it's like a siren coming in. And it was we were under attack from uh, Monokushitas, a 122 um, rocket launchers. And uh, there was a major, major jumbo litter. Um, is it Don? I think it's Don, but jumbo. No, jumbo. And he was in the base. But the, the Turks came in and they... They did a recce on the temporary where the 32 battalion guys were lying. They didn't rocket the base. They rocketed us. And Jumbo used to stand on the, the, the wall of, of the base. And he could see from where they were firing because it makes a, a, a big red flash when it departs. And he could see it from where. So he, was, he used to shout to us, Takumala, it's coming. <laughs> And the next moment you would hear this, you know, the rockets coming in. But um, of course, I can tell you, to be shelled with a 122s is no joke. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a frightening thing. The next day we did a follow-up, uh, but we didn't get the guys. Okay, that was it. Um, of course, back in the base um, at, at uh, Amahoni, um, we did some progressive training and, um, uh, you know, obviously the, the um, adversary activities increased in the Inana area of north of the border. And um, we had to do um, search and destroy operations. So what we did was we used to have a spotter in the air, uh, a Bosbok in the air. We used to troop in with two Puma helicopters. That they would identify. The intelligence would say, okay, in that area, there's this. Um, flush the crawls. So the spotter was in the air. Two Puma helicopters with the Reiki group. And we would, um, you know, be dropped on, on whatever side of, of, of this crawl. Um, we would form up and then sweep these crawls. Um, and we always always had two Alouette helicopters, gunships, to our uh, disposal with 20 millimeter cannons. And they were devastating. So we did a lot of this, you know, from crawl to crawl to crawl, you know, sweep a crawl, there's nothing in there and, and so on. And at this stage, um, Don Pience was the, the intelligence officer. And Don said, it's impossible that you cannot find anything there. There must be this. So the, he, he said, burn the crawls. You know, chase the people out and burn the crawls. So that's what we did. And of course, when we started lighting the, 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 
the huts and and they've got a big uh, you know a wooden crawl around the, the hut when we started burning that it was a little war on its own of all the mines and ammunition and grenades that actually exploded so what the, the thirst did they they hit their um, they made their caches in this uh, crawls and in the huts and under the floors and in the roof and so on so when that occurred um, it became a principle so it actually became a scorched earth tactics which we had to apply in that certain area so that's what the recce group did at that stage you know from crawl to crawl three four five crawls a day and you were really you know poor tight at the end of the day tired but we we actually destroyed so much ammunition landmines grenades and whatever that was hidden in 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 those um you know in the crawls and and, and so on so you know it was it was devastating to chase the povu out of the area but um you know war is war you know if the if if the population is supporting the tears um you you're not acting aggressively and killing povu but you are destroying the infrastructure that actually supports the enemy so that that's basically what we did um and it it you know it contributed a lot to the effectivity of the um, adversaries and the operations they launched into into um, namibia um was then um uh, the 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 conventional forces started moving uh, more and more from unjiva and you know the the, the northern bases so a decision was taken that we should restrict the movement of conventional forces how an area was identified where we would lie landmines so what we did is an area was identified um exact um, uh, location was given so once again A, a team of 12 guys would would get into a a, a puma helicopter with with landmines then we would go two guys would be dropped off you plant plant the mine you know go into a position one is checking the other guys planting the mine drop off two drop off two drop off two drop off two come back pick up the the first team um drop that off so we would really mine a, a huge area um you know in in a day so and 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 it, we went quite deep into angola up to 90 120 k's you know in in the area where there was conventional moving movement so at this stage um the tears realized if there's a chopper and it goes down there's going to be a landmine so they dispersed um sections or you know detachment into into a wide area so they weren't in the base they were scattered all around um i just want to quickly halt yeah um you remember in in the first episode i referred to corporal kim zoger that was my corporal at at infantry school now after blue left and ron gregory left one day who arrives at amahoni corporal or then sergeant kim zoger so eventually kim asked for a transfer to 32 battalion and he said he wanted to be you know in support of the the, the recce group so i was the commander of of the recce group and who became my base sergeant major kim zoger and you know i told you in the first episode that he was really a you know a great guy but there kim was and um you know he was supporting us and 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 he was a good nco and very well disciplined and neat and whatever why i'm why i'm bringing this in um one day kim came to me he said france can't I go on one of these mine laying operations with you now you know he wasn't part of the recce group so 
you know, I don't know if I was authorized to actually take him, but I knew he was a good soldier and disciplined. And, you know, if, 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 if the chips was down, Kim would do his thing. So I said, yes, come. So Kim went with me and we were really also deep into an area. Dropped down and Kim was, you know, checking it out. Here I was just busy, you know, digging the hole to put the mine. Kim said, France, you know, Lieutenant, <laughs> they're coming for us. So it's then when we realized, you know, and the other teams also reported, you know, they were on the ground for about 10, 15 minutes and somebody were, was coming towards, towards them. In any case, we did some escape and evasion and the choppers took us up and we all withdrew back to Amoni. So I recommended to, to Eddie Falloon and, uh, oh yes, then uh, Colonel Dion Ferrara took over from um, Colonel Gartnell. So he was fresh, I think, from infantry school, but uh, also a brilliant guy. So I recommended to him, I said to him, sir, I suggest the following. We do the same thing, but at the first place we drop, the whole team gets off. Twelve of us, and we plant the mine, and we shift 10 meters, 20 meters from the place we planted the mine, and we lie in ambush. Because we know they're going to react to where the, 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 um, the chopper landed. Now, of course, um, I don't know how well it's documented in the other books written about 32 Battalion, but we had huge success in getting kills. Because, you know, they, they initially thought it's only these two people, and then they would rush up, you know, in small groups to, to wherever it was, and, and we really had good operational successes by doing that. And then... Um, there was two incidences I want to relate about this. There's a place with the name Chihet. Chihet. Um, I think it's about, oh, I can't remember, about 30 k's or more in, in, into Angola. But um, there was a lot of activity there. And um, we did the same thing, you know, did the drop, planted the mines, and we lay there until about three hours and it was strange that nobody reacted to to this place any case it was decided right you know let's get picked up and 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 go to another place so we went to an area a, a little sauna now i would say it was about 30 meters in in, in uh, you know across and um the chopper came in we secured the area chopper came in you know all round defense and I always used to count in all the people, you know, count them in, and I got in last. Then I knew everybody was in, nobody is left behind, and the chopper took off. So, you know, the, the guys was going in, 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 and all of a sudden the chopper just took off and it flew, the, the, the puma. And there it was me, and, and I, I can't remember if it was either Opis or Tiens. There we were, two guys on the ground. And the chopper just buggered off. And um, the, the, the captain of the, the chopper radioed back. He said they, they were taking fire, enemy fire. And um, so they came from the opposite side, from the Chiet side. Um, they, there was actually a patrol on its way to where we had the ambush. And the chopper was there. And I mean, it was a great risk. And he, and he took off. So it was the two of us now on the ground, chopper gone, and there we were. But luckily, in that area, there was big trees, and there was fallen trees and so on, and, and really trees you could hide behind. So we were lying there checking this out. Now the chopper had left, and the Tiz thought, well, the chopper is gone, so, you know, there's nobody. So they came there and walked around, and this is now like 15 meters from us all. 10 meters from us and I said to Opis or, or Tiens they'll correct me at the stage as to if it was Opis or Tiens in any case I said to them these guys are getting too close to us so we opened fire on them 
So we knocked over a, a, a few of these guys and then there was total confusion because they thought everybody had, you know, gone off with their helicopters and, and it was like, you know, shooting clay pigeon. Um, and <laughs> we dropped a few and, and then it was chaos and they ran into the bush. But um, remember now, there was always two gunships on standby and the spotter plane was on standby. So the, the helicopter reported, okay, you know, contact and, um, you know, two guys on the ground and, you know, they found a, a safe place and we joined up and there was a spotter in there and the two allies was there. Now, as the, uh, the, the KK commander in the, in the Bosbok was a, a major skitter, he was actually a, a, a loggy, a major, but a, a brilliant guy. So he, we, we used to talk. I was the commander on the ground, and he used to say, okay, France, go east, go west, you know, form up like this, whatever. So we chased those guys, of course, and the, 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 the Allos was having a ball of a time. I think we killed 18 turfs that day. And uh, when we started rounding them up, they flew out all the corpses, and there was there was one guy still alive, which we kept alive and put in a drip for interrogation and so on. But the interesting thing about that, they all had brand new uniforms, brand new AKs, brand new Tokarevs, Makarovs. Um, their pockets was full of money, kwachas. And, you know, obviously it was a new detachment that came in freshly equipped, just paid and whatever. Up to this day, I still have bundles of, of, of quatches that is soiled with blood and, 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 and stuff like that. But that was an interesting thing. And, um, you know, our tactics really worked. So um, then a few days later, we had to deploy into a certain area, do the same thing. Now, I was sit always as, as the, the, the team commander, I was sitting in a, in a tech seat between the two pilots just off at the back to navigate with them and so on. So the place we had to stop, and it's also, it, it's between on Jiva and Chiet, and, you know, it was quite far in. And there was a, a road running east-west. And um, when, when time and distance on the chopper came up, you know, we didn't see this road. So, you know, I, I think it was Ojain, the pilot, he said, you know, let's, let's go on for a while. So we kept, we kept going for five minutes. Now, five minutes in a chopper is some miles. In any case, we saw a big road. He said, well, drop off. Stop, drop off, and we get out. In any case, we, we plant the mine, same tactics, and I was still putting out an inverted L ambush. So I'm still, you know, I, I identified my place, just made a shell scrape. And um, I was putting out the, the, the arcs of fire of, of the people. While I was doing, and the guys were digging in, while I was doing that, of course, there was like a company attacking us. And, um, you know, I died for my shell scrape. The other guys was okay, and we had a hell of a fight back. And uh, the, the radio guy, you know, he radioed uh, contact, contact, wait out, and, you know, the felt started burning, and... It was dust and clouds and, and whatever. And, and the spotter went up and the aloes went up into the area to where we should have been dropped. So they were up and they say, we can't see you. I said, it is impossible. You know, with, so they say, throw, you know, white foss so that we can see where you are. We throw white foss. They say they don't see anything. I say, it is impossible. Get out. Go to, I don't know how many meters and, and whatever. So we were dropped in the wrong place, so close to the enemy bases that they uh, you, you know, attacked us with this force. But we really put up a brave fight, and they withdraw, and then they formed up again. And after uh, quite some time, eventually the spotters say, we see some smoke on the horizon type of thing, you know, and eventually they pitched up there. Now, of course, that was also a big scrap from from there. But we were running low on the ammo. And um, there, um, uh, Stefan's van der Waal, Major, uh, also a very, very, very good guy. Um, he was in one of the helicopters. He had a folding butt 
um, um, R1, and he was lying on the on the floor shooting tears from the you know from the chopper. And we also you know really had very very good success there, and eventually you know we were flown out. But the interesting thing, the the one of the choppers, one of the the allos, was hit um, with with bullets, and the pilot was Andre Hatting, Lieutenant Hatting. Now, if you Google or go into the the system, Andre Hatting, I think he's the highest decorated um, SAF person. Uh, he's got the Honoris Crooks, the Ein Cross, or the the, Miller, uh, the the Air Force Cross, etc., etc., etc. But such a humble, such a nice guy, such a you know brave pilot. In any case, we went back to um, to 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 Amahoni, flew back there, and he was coming in. I was standing at Amahoni when when the the Allo came in. So he landed. When he landed. He didn't do a vertical landing. He, he did a, a running landing. The, there was no, I, I think the, the hydraulic fluid was out, but he couldn't apply his brakes. So, you, you, you know, the, the chopper just ran. And he picked up the chopper, turned it around into a, you know, picked it up, did a 360 and landed vertically. You know, and I said, you know, the, the skills of our pilots was just, amazing and um, in any case they they came and picked up that uh, aloe with a, a c-130 and and took it away um of course yeah that is uh that is just some of the operations then I, I i just quickly want to reflect i think i'm going far over my time you must stop me if if, if we are running over um of course i also had to do some um um uh, formative, the, uh, format, the formative branch. Um, they said if you if you join join short term, it's three years. It's one year longer than your national service. Then you get um, permanent force um, privileges. Um, your rank structure gets ad adopted to a full a full lieutenant. Obviously, your pay goes up and your pay is higher and and so on. And I had a study. I had to pay some study um, debt back, you know, and this and you would get off some um, camps and so on. I thought this is a good idea, you know. So I joined short service and then, but I had to do formative branch. So eventually I went for formative branch and um, at Heidelberg. And there's a few stories and I, I can relate there, which also had an impact on my career later, but I think time is, doesn't allow. Um, and in any case, during the time I was at the uh, formative branch at Heidelberg, um, Willem Ratte was um, drafted into 32 Battalion. And um, Colonel Dion Ferrada, he was a captain, and I think he came from the SAS in, in, in Rhodesia. Obviously, a, a brilliant soldier, a seasoned soldier uh, with a lot of experience. And um, he was appointed then as the official commander of, of Reiki Group in my absence while I was at um, um, formative branch. So when I came back from formative branch, um, you know, Colonel Ferrara informed me about the situation. I was totally happy, you know, to me it was it was fine. And um, came back to, to Amahoni and served under uh, Willem and he was a great guy. Um, then um, was at the the Rikis, um in the relationship thirty two had with the Rikis. They said that um, they could the thirty two Reiki group could send um, some guys to to the Rikis to participate and do the the, the Reiki group minor tactics at Buffalo, uh, not Buffalo, at at Fort Dopis. And I was nominated and three other guys. So um, we went during the time Willem was there. He did a lot of changes at the Mahoney base and, you know, started um, instituting um, the knowledge and the experience he had, which was all beneficial um, for, for the Reiki group. 
and I was doing um, minor tactics with the Rekis, which was brilliant. And, um, you know, it really went well um, to such to such a uh, situation that I came first on the course. So obviously the instructors, they asked me, wouldn't you be interested in coming over to, to, to Special Forces? And, you know, Nick the Toy and Faber and, you know, all the people I knew, you know, I thought mm, maybe I'm, I'm short service now, but, you know, think about that later. Any case, back to, to 32 Battalion, um, back to the Reiki group. And um, then uh, was the, right opposite Rundu is a, is a place called Kalai, um, a small town. And the activities started, you know, increasing there. And um, there was a, the, the, the intelligence people in charge was uh, Colonel Mo Ulsich. Ulsich. There's two Ulsich brothers of which Mo was in charge of the intelligence area uh, of, of um, Sector 20. So they said uh, they need some of these people to interrogate. 32 battalion reggae group, go and do a snatch operation, catch somebody, bring them back, and uh, they'll interrogate them. So three teams was identified, of which myself again, and Zach Garrett, and I think Eric Rawi at that stage, at three different places we had to conduct a snatch operation. So I planned this operation. I said, I'll do it on a Friday night. I know on a Friday night, um, they all have a piss up. You know, they go to the bar and drink chabuku or whatever. And I will conduct it in that area. And I will go to the place to the, where they urinate and, and, and let themselves off. So that was my plan. So we planned it in such a way that the, the first part of the night had moon so that we can, could infiltrate and then, you know, do the snatch. And then it was the second phase, dark phase, so that we could, in the darkness, escape from, you know, the place where we executed the snatch. So said, so done. So we were five people. And now Tabu Maria, um, which is a doctor now, um, uh, and Van Eden, myself, I can't remember the other guy. In any case, we, we were taken over the river, um, infiltrated thick um, um, reeds and so on. We really battled to get through. And there was a, a very open area with, you know, very sparsely bushes. And then there was a road and we would cross this road and infiltrate from the north into Kalai to, to do the, the snatch. So as we were moving up towards the road, we heard in the road, there was a patrol coming. You could hear the PKM rounds, you know, bumping on the on the magazines and so on. And of course, we were in the open. There was no cover whatsoever. There was one little bush. And for the five of us to get, you know, to, to, to actually get cover on the bush was, was virtually not possible. But in any case, we dashed for this bush, sat behind that bush. And I said to the guys, okay, We'll conduct our snatch here. I mean, it's an opportunity. Let's do it. And 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 doctrine, you know, dictated that the commander would walk towards the third of the front. You know, he had these scouts and a few people, and then the, the commander, and then the, the rest. In any case, I said, okay, we'll we'll wait for them. Let some guys pass, and then we'll move in. I would take on the the rear part of the, the, the squad that was coming in, the other guy would take on the front part and, and Tabu and, and, and the other guy would go for somebody, grab him and, you know, do the snatch. So said and so done. So when they were past us, you know, we, we broke cover and, um, and we did. So um, <laughs> we caught this guy. I mean, you can imagine the chaotic situation. And, um, you, you know, we opened fire. And I want to say, Chris, before 12 o'clock that night, we were back in Rundu base um, with a captured um, Tur 
and you know the snatch over and down. Uh, but but the other places they run into problems and and you know, it's a story for a little uh, other time. But that was also an interesting thing to to actually you know conduct a snatch and I think it is one of the few successful snatch operations that was conducted um, as far as I am aware of. There might be, but I'm not aware of. It. So that was also interesting, you know, to to have the experience to actually go do a snatch in enemy territory, catch somebody, bring them back and, and get interrogated. Um, of course, yes, then um, I want to start going to the end of, 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 of this series. Um, I was then informed that there was a, a selection, a, a Reiki selection going on and um, uh, uh, Colonel Fulhun, or I think he became a, a, a commandant then during that time, he informed me that uh, there's a recce selection on. Am I interested to do recce selection? So I said to him, yes, um, you know, yes, I'll, I'll try. In any case, dates were confirmed and um, we were starting to prepare for an operation and that was Operation um, uh, Savati. We didn't know where it was or what it was, but um, you know, Willem, had, had, as the commander then of the Reiki group, I had more information. But in any case, I opted to go on selection. So I left and um, I arrived in, in um, Fort Dopis um, directly from the Rundu, and I was joined by, or not, I was joined, um, I joined a group of really a lot of um, students. Most of them was um, from from the parachute battalion and then um, from various places wherever they selected, pre-selected people to, to do the um, selection. Of course, I'm under correction, um, but it, we were about 121 um, people there. Um, in the in the Dopis area, we went into an area where we had to, you know, go into a temporary base, and you know, the, we were stuffed up and PT and, and and a lot of things. The the way they do their selection. In any case, um, selection started um, with a with a very long march towards the uh, Kwandu River, and. Um, a speed march. So, you know, during that leg from our temporary, but I think it was about 30 k's, you know, during that march, um, some guys dropped off. Um, at the river, we freshened up and, you know, could wash our faces and so on. No, we drink water. And, and, and then another, the whole clearance process, the whole selection process started. So it mainly um, consisted of, of, of very um, strenuous um, PT, um, pole carrying, route marches um, against time and, and so on. And then, as I've mentioned before, um, there were psychiatrists or, yeah, what do you call them, psychiatrists, that, that uh, constantly monitored us and, and um, you know, did the evaluation, they had formal evaluation sheets and, you know, conducted verbal um, interviews with you and, and so on. So it went on like that for about 10 days. Then we were um, taken to the Botswana border, which is the southern border of the Caprivi Strip. And we were dropped um, as body pairs, two, 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 two along the Botswana uh, cut line. And we all got bearings in a northerly direction um, to report to a certain RV, um, which they gave. Now, I can't remember the guy I walked with, but, um, you know, he was, uh, I'm not complaining, but, you know, I had to encourage him constantly. And, and you know, eventually we got to the, the RV and, um, then the next day, and from there, you got individual bearings, you know, one, 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 one. Now we were going into the, I think the third week, so 21 days. Of course, and 
and there the interesting thing starts. Now, the Caprivi, the, the Dopis area is, is wild, like really wild. You know, there's line, um, any animal, white, black rhino, elephant, um, all types of antelope and so on, uh, hyena. So, you know, during your route marches, you would bump into these animals and, you know, you had, you, you had to deal with, with whatever. And you only had one round. I think we had um, yeah, R1s. You only had one round to defend yourself either in the most extreme situation or kill yourself. That was the, um, you know. <laughs> and, and the instructors was um, Willie Ward, was uh, the PV van Jerden Kaffersmit, uh, Andre Klute, and a series of guys that, that conducted this. Now, after about the fifth day, really walking 30 kilometers plus a day um, through the bush with no food, um, you had to get your own water. And, and of course, up to today, I know that Dopi's area like the palm of my hand. I knew where there was water holes. I knew where, whatever. And if you got the bearing in a certain direction, I knew. I, I made myself, I had a pen and a, and a small notebook. I, I did, did reckoning and, and the route marches. So I know if I got that bearing, if I veer off there, um, you know, I could get water, get some um, food in the felt, and then I would carry on. And then, of course, I would get to the Arvies most of the times prior to the time I have to be there. Now, I was starting getting alone after two weeks on my own in the bush. And I was wondering, where is my buddies? You know, so I would lie up near the Arvi and, you know, and I would scout around, uh, you know, in 32, I learned these things, you know, do um, cross graining and so on. And I couldn't pick up spoor. And, um, you know, then the instructors would come and I would wait on my time and I would move in. And they said, you know, your buddies was here long ago and, you know, stuff me up with pity and, you know, carrying extra things and so on. And why are you late? But I'm not late, you know. And I started wondering about this situation, you know. Uh, and in any case, it kept on like that for about another week. So this was going a month now on, you know, walking that Doppies area, crisscrossing it everywhere. In any case, um, then I got the last or, or a bearing to the Paris Coup. It's a well-known place in, 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 in the river. And I was there long before I actually had to be there. And I, I literally took off all my clothes, naked, went into the river, and I found a small piece of Pears soap. I don't know if you know pears soap, but um, it, it got stuck somewhere in my kit, but it was like really mushed into a corner. But I discovered this and I got that. It's not bigger than my thumbnail. So I washed my hair with that piece of, um, you know, pear soap. And I lied in the sun. And, you know, when the time came up again to, uh, to actually, you know, report at the RV, I rolled in the dust. I crawled through um, mud and, you know, so that the instructors couldn't realize that I actually, you know, washed myself and had a good time. But they were far smarter than I thought they were. So they, you know, I don't know if they smell the soap or, or whatever. But um, so I was really stuffed up again, like big time. And then there's a place called um, uh, Hippo Base. It still exists. There's a big, nice camp there today. Um, and the, the, the commando was doing retraining there. You know, they were preparing for one or other operation. And um, my last leg was walking there. So I arrived there and uh, um, Colonel Swart, um, Jake Swart, rest in peace, passed away about two years ago. He was the commander of Special Forces at that stage. Or um, of one Ricky, um, General Lourdes was told. So um, 
you know, he said, well, you know, where's your buddies? And I said, no, I don't know, you know, and kept on knocking on me. And, and, and he said, okay, um, fall in with a commando. They are doing training. So they did clipper training. Now it's clipper rowing into the river. And how do you have to tie your kit and things like that? So I had to do that with the, the guys. But now remember, I was doing selection, walking, no food, you know, well, not no food, but they gave you food that was soaked in diesel or um, mosquito, uh, anti-mosquito stuff. So yeah, I, I lost a lot of, you know, kilos and, and my feet were full of blisters. And at night they said to me, okay, row to an island, you know, lie up there. We will come and search for you. If we find you, you are dead. You know, that type of threat. So, you know, I went to road to this island, um, you know, camouflaged the, the, the kayak. And, um, you know, I find a nice place under a tree and uh, it was actually bloody nice. In any case, they came to look for me. They couldn't find me and night fell. And the crocodiles started climbing out of the water. And I, I was lying where the crocodiles would rest at night. Yes, of course, so that chased me into the trees. So I slept. Oh, you can't sleep in a tree. You know, don't let anybody tell you any story. You do not sleep in a tree unless you have a mammoth or whatever. I mean, it's, it's virtually impossible. So the next morning, they uh, looked for me and you know, they couldn't find me. And uh, they shouted, OK, you have to come out now. And I, I thought, stuff you, you know, it's my time to get you back. You know, you can look for me. I can just pretend that I didn't hear them or whatever. So, you know, I parked there for a while. Any case, came out and that uh, late afternoon, did training with them the whole day. And that late afternoon, they said to me, I had to row upstream to the um, base, to the, 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 the Reiki base. Now, time and distance wouldn't allow that. I knew I couldn't make it because there's so many, you know, um, side streams and whatever. If you don't get to the mainstream in daylight, I mean, you're going to get lost. So, you know, I really went for it and I didn't tie my kit properly the way we were taught um, just to get away, to get to the mainstream before nightfall. In any case, I was away for let's say about a kilometer, um, one of the rubber ducks came, you know, and um, they said, okay, you know, Kerang is over. It's, it's over now. But you always heard this story, you know, they'll tell you Kerang is over and then if you, you know, give up, it's not over and whatever. In any case, I said, no, it's not over. You know, I kept on rowing. And it was Koki the Kok, Bram the Kok, um, Willie Ward and PJ Furi. They were on the, on the rubber duck. So I refused to, you know, they, they threw me a, a tow line and say, you know, we're going to tow you back. I said, no. So Willie Ward said, this is an order now. It's, I am an officer. It's an order. Take that rope. Your selection is over now. Take that rope. If you do not take that rope, I will charge you for, um, you know, ignoring a, a lawful command. <laughs> so I thought, okay, take the rope. In any case, uh, quest, so... Uh, took the rope and they towed me back and that was the end of Kerang. So um, I think the total time I spent um, walking on my own, going on my own was it is in excess of three weeks. 21 days plus now the time you had with, with the other guys. And then they actually told me, you know, you were, for the past three weeks, you were the only guy on, on, on selection. And then Willie Ward, before he passed away, and even today, Andre um, Klute is still alive. In fact, he called me the other day. He said, you are the most Arahat person they have ever met. You know, they, they, because they wanted to go on with training, but they still had a selection running. And they said, yeah, we can't keep a selection going for one guy. So just stuff him up and get him off, get rid of him type of thing so they tried their level best to get rid of me and you know you get into a state of mind where you just don't crack 
And uh, in any case, poor so yes, um, I think there was, to the best of my knowledge, and I can be corrected, but there was two selections where there was, um, you know, quite significant people that only one person made it. And, and you know, I, I was fortunate to be on, on one of those. Now, that also had the impact. Um, you know, if you have a, a, a selection group, you do, let's say it's 10 guys or 12 or whatever that make a, a selection, they go through the training process, you know, that building blocks. So I was the only guy. And I have done um, minor tactics with the Rekis, came first on the course, and, you know, did the 32 battalion stuff and so on. So um, I was like in between, you know, if there was a, a, a demolition course, I went on the demolition course. If there was survival, I went. So, you know, and, and it was actually very good and stimulating because I did certain courses with certain selection groups. And, um, you know, I did all my courses within a year and, uh, you know, really got to know a lot of, the guys and um, eventually then um, uh, you know integrated into one last thing I want to relate to us and I think we way over time is when I went back from um, Dopis to Rundu now Savati was on over that time I didn't know that um, there was a Dakota flying from Amalman back to um, Rundu now, I was the only pack on the on the on the Dakota, and we landed in the Rundu, and um, you know the, the Dakota stopped. I climbed out, and on the runway or on the side, uh, Major Fulun was there, or Eddie Fulun was there. But I saw some impalas, and you know there was really a lot of activity going on. But uh, Eddie Fulun, Echo Victor was walking towards me, and you know I, I have a great a lot of respect for him, you know, I saluted him and so on. And he walked up to me, he said, Franz, today is my, is one of my most joyful days and one of my saddest days. And, you know, couldn't quite understand what he meant, but he said, most joyful because you made the, the, the special forces selection, you were the only guy that passed, and uh, congratulations. He says, but also the saddest day, and he told me about Savati. You know, the casualties they had and um, um, I would say half of the people that actually got killed there, Shal Muller, Rassi, those guys was, was friends of mine. You know, I knew, I knew them very, very well. So he told me this and, um, you know, it was, it was really a sad time. And then I saw Zelda. Zelda was the, the wife of Shal Muller. She came walking towards us. And um, there was three Impalas taxiing out to the end of the runway. And, and when she got to us, you know, they, they simultaneously took off. So it's quite impressive to see three, you know, Impalas taking off like that. And, you know, when they took off, um, Zelda just said, kill the effers, you know, the, the fuckers, sorry for the word. And, um, and she collapsed. You know, she passed out and, um, you know, we helped her up because she, she actually just got the news that her husband was killed and, and so on. So it was it was quite a traumatic thing. But yes, you know that. So it was very significant and, and uh, the thing I remember and can recall. Long story short, of course, I went back to, to Amahoni. Um, I opted to join um, special forces, and and obviously with the Savati thing, there was chaotic, you know, um, things going on in Amaoni base. So I didn't have even have time to greet most of my friends and so on. And I cleared out from 32 battalion, and um, I I had to report two weeks later in in Durban at one recce. So I had a, a period of of two weeks of leave. Um, and that's basically my, my time through 32 Battalion. The last thing I want to say, was, and th there's a few stories I still have, yeah, but, but time is catching us. Um, I spent 18 years in Special Forces, uh, the true Rekis. Now, 
I want to testify today, and I've said it to many of my people on several occasions. My basic foundation of soldiering was laid in 32 Battalion. Um, I had more contacts and um, skirmishes in 32 Battalion than actually in my time in Special Forces. It's two different organizations. So I'm not saying that in a derogative way towards Special Forces. It's a different organization. But um, 32 Battalion um, is one of the units or the unit, I believe, that makes a man of you very, very quickly. You know, I have the greatest respect for the people, especially the, the, the guys in the companies. You know, brutal, Papa. You attack a base, you know, frontal and, you know, you get losses, but, but you do the job. No nonsense, no big support in the early days. Um, but uh, my greatest, greatest respect for all soldiers, the leader group, the commanders of 32 Battalion. And um, I salute them. And uh, I'm part of their uh, veterans organization, and I will always attend their meetings. And um, they are a great brotherhood, as is the Special Forces. But all my honor to, to the guys of 32 Battalion, they are great. Of course, I'm going to stop there. Um, if you allow me, I, I, I will take my days in, in, in one recce and... And maybe to the end of, of my military academy uh, time in the next episode, because I think that's, that's logical phases, and, and, and I can tell you more of that. Of course, thank you very much for the opportunity once again. Um, I, I hope I didn't bore people, but um, that is what it is. Thank you very much. Well, there's no such thing as time limits. We don't have time limits. If people get tired, and why should they? Just press the pause button, you know, it's not a big deal. But we can't, this was just fantastic. I have to, uh, some sad news for you, Bo. I know that when Dirk March uh, passed last year of uh, COVID, he was a good man. I always say, I know something about him. In the sense that Esfia for he was here, said he dated his daughter for one month, but they didn't even touch our hands or something. Uh, he had bloody nice daughters. I can yes, tell you that. Yes. Quite sure about that because I... <laughs> but I want to thank you. I want to thank you for Eddie Fulhoun, Echo Victor. So if you're listening, yeah, please come and talk to us. Um, everybody says to me, I should speak to you. Get your memories down. It's really, I, I understand. The, um, and I don't know if this is true, but if you want to smoke while you're talking to us, you're more than welcome. We'll even give you a beer. Whatever it takes, please come and speak to us. Um, I think your story should not should not go away. It should live forever. And then lastly, I must ask you, how long have you been married? I'm going to embarrass myself now, but um, 31, 32 years. Right. Yeah. Now I have a message for your wife, sir. I presume she can speak of Afrikaans. My vrouw, leen vir ons kolonel Frans net vir so 2-3 uur week. That's all what comes from. All 65,000 from us what he can. And if you can't understand what I've said now, phone a South African mate, and I'm sure they will translate to you. Was, uh, remember, I, 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 I said I, when I hunted and uh, with Dirk much I met somebody. It's, it's Jan Spies. Now, Jan Spies was the um, redacteur of the Patri Patriot, the Side Vester or something, the newspaper. He was the, you know, the, 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 um, the mouthpiece of the DTA. Yeah. The Turiala Alliance of Dirk Maj. I want to tell you this story quickly and, and I will stop that. You can cut it out of the, the program if you want to. We went to the farms. We shot two um, kudu and two gemsbok. And one morning, very, very early, it was about four o'clock, we were um, cutting boltong in the, uh, it's not a double gar garage in Dirk Maja's home. It was like, you know, four or five cars could park there. And there was big stainless steel tables. So at this stage, I just hear, Maagdag Dirk, 
maar dat is nou vir jou een hoop vlees die. En, you know, <laughs> I've read Jan Spies, you know, with a Krimora advertisements and so on. And, you know, and there was um, Jan Spies, you know, peeping around the corner. And, um, and, and, and he's a, he was a professor in Afrikaans, yes. Jan Spies. So, he said, Jan, weet jy waar die naam Biltong vandaan kom? So, Dirk said, no. He said, let ek jou vertel. So, he says, um, in, the, in the time of the Cape, the, when the Cape colony was formed, they used to slaughter oxen, and they took the the boat, the, the buttocks, meat, and they would cut it in strips and hang it over um, over a wire or in the bush or whatever to dry. Now, a boat or a buttock in um, uh, Dutch is a billen. The, the drillen, the billen van the whoever. So he said, so Bultong, the first phase or, or, or syllabus of, of Bultong is bull, it comes from the boat place, bullen. And tong, you cut the meat, it looks like a tongue. So the word bultong comes from, from the, those two words. So the meat was cut from the, the buttocks, the bullen, and that's where the word bultong comes from. So, you know, he told that story and it was just interesting and, you know, I'm just relating that as a as a lot. Oh, that's fantastic. I never knew that. And for those who don't know who's uh, this comedian, this professor, I will try to get hold of that ad which you had with Cremora. And then you might understand a bit more. But this guy was extremely famous. I don't know if he's still in life. He must be no, a very no, old he, man. He passed away life. some years ago as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, but what a person. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic man. Fantastic man. Yeah. And he was elegant. Yeah. But I think we've come I, to the end of this one now. And I have to say to you, thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to the next one. And so will thousands of other people, I'm quite sure. And look, the stories which we haven't told you yet, we might that one day have another episode where you people can actually ask questions directly and we can you know, answer as far as it's possible because certain things in, in the man's life will, will have to remain secret. Uh, there's reasons for that. I'm sure everybody understands. Uh, but it's real, really not the end of, of France for E and uh, legacy conversations. So I'm really grateful. I know there's a book being written in the background. So just keep watching here. Yeah? You might never know what comes out. And to all of you, I want to say to you, you're not unimportant. Please come and talk to us. Um, it doesn't matter if you were not in Free Two Battalion or one of the famous units or a Ricky or something like that. All of you contributed and all of you were valuable. So if you feel that you want to tell your story, uh, please contact me. That's all you do. You just contact me and I will take it further. Until we meet again, God bless. Thank you, Chris.